Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing this morning? Are you, are you so glad to be here? All right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's build a highway for the King. Let's make His praise beautiful. Let's build a highway for the King. Let's make His praise glorious. Brokenness, we come, O Lord. Generation to seek your face. Oh, preparing the way for the King to come. Let's build a highway for the King. Let's make his praise beautiful. Let's build a highway for the King. Let's make his praise glorious. And as we come alone, generation to fear your name, oh, preparing the way for the King to come. Oh, come and make our praise glorious, make our praise glorious. You are all the King, all the nations see, tell of your great love. High upon our praise, our voice is raised to make your praise glorious. It's been a highway for the king, just make his praise beautiful. Highway for the King, make His praise glorious. In brokenness we come, O oh Lord, a generation to seek Your face. Oh, preparing the way for the King to come. Oh, come. Let our 
Jesus be the center of your 
your church And every knee will bow And every tongue shall confess you Jesus 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 from my heart Jesus be the did at the cross for us. Amen. Amen. Are you so glad about it today? Yes. Hallelujah. I tell you, it's time to be excited about what Christ is doing. Amen. He's doing it everywhere, and what we got to do is just tell the people of the goodness of God and His riches and His love toward us. Yes. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. the glory and the honor Lord we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name you deserve the glory and the honor Lord we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name, and you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you, there is no one else like you, and you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no You are great. 
deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we live. You deserve the glory.
stand in that place As a last meeting face to face I'm yours, Jesus, you are mine In this joy, perfect peace Only pain finally will cease Celebrate, Jesus is alive changed are you changed forever changed because of what Jesus did amen? amen not because of our goodness but because of what Jesus did amen. anyway God bless you all would you fellowship for just a moment and uh, welcome one another this morning Good morning, good morning, Fellowship Church. It's so good to see you guys. It's good to see our Facebook friends, too. Hope you all are having a great day. So uh, it's been a while since you've seen me, so I have um, a couple of quick, quick announcements. One, I just want to say um, it's kind of a reminder. I don't know if you guys remember at Christmas, 
Uh, we help the DSS here in Nash County uh, with Christmas presents, and uh, a lot of you donated money. Um, and they had such a surplus of extra money. Um, I got an email, and ironically, I just got this email a few weeks ago, but they were able to take, with the surplus from the Christmas campaign, that extra money that they had, they were able to take 16 children to a Stars and Strikes in Raleigh, which is basically like laser tag, bumper cars, arcade type stuff. Um, I know some of you are like, well, we're a church. This doesn't matter much. Guys, it matters, okay? To know that, that a body of Christ in this community is helping children in this community. These are foster children who may not have the opportunity to do things like this. You know, our kids, we take them wherever. We go on trips and vacations. Uh, sometimes foster kids don't get those opportunities. And to know that churches in this area support this is amazing, guys. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. Um, they also tell a story of an 8-year-old that was very shy, um, didn't want to do anything, but came out of their shell during a laser tag event. Um, this child has been in several placements, meaning they've been taken out of their home multiple times, had severe trust and anxiety issues, and through this one event, um, this child has basically come out of the shell and has learned to trust and love. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so those of you that donated gifts, uh, I, they went to children in foster care in this county. Uh, if you donated cash, some of your money actually went to this event. So I just want you to know that um, these little things, they matter. So speaking of little things, which Dr. Mark always says there are no little things, um, sometimes a hug at the right time, it's not a little thing, is it? It's a big thing. So um, every year around this time, we do a... Uh, we sponsor children for book bags. Raise your hand if you've supported this in the past. Thank you, I appreciate it. Again, this may seem small, but we uh, have about 25 kids that we need to um, get book bags for, school supplies. Uh, these are kids that um, you see in our church almost every Sunday, um, and we wanna help them start school with some confidence. Start with um, the supplies that they need things that, that they have. Y'all don't know, like a brand new box of crayons on the first day of school. Best book bag in the classroom. That's a big deal in a second grader, third grader's brain. So just keep that in mind. Um, so in two weeks, um, those book bags are due. I have, again, I have a list of 25 kids. If you would like to help sponsor a student, um, you can buy book bags. Someone, graciously, that I can't name, uh, gave me two grocery bags full of school supplies uh, just this morning, just notebooks, binders. Uh, guys, any of that is, is acceptable. It's great. Uh, maybe you're thinking, well, I can't afford like a book bag and supplies. Maybe you can just go to Walmart and pick up a book bag. Then everything works out, I promise you. People give supplies. People give book bags. Anything and everything can help. Some of you may say, oh, well, Julia, I haven't had a student in a long time. I don't even know what I'm supposed to get. <laughs> um, I will give you the name and age of a student, and if you need help, I can help you get what they need. Um, you can also just give me maybe five, ten dollars, whatever you can, and I'll go shop for that student, okay? Um, so if you would like to help in any way, uh, see me after church. I'll be in the foyer, okay? All right, thank you, guys. I told her this morning, I said, beautiful age. So she done it. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? As Brother George would say so eloquently, we're on the road again. The season citizens will be going to LaGrange next Saturday. We'll leave here at 1 o'clock, around 1 o'clock, and we'll go and eat seafood. If you want some good seafood, they got some of the best. So remember, on the 13th, which is next Saturday, around 1 o'clock, be here at the church, and we'll be ready to ride, and we're going to try to do this more often. Uh, thank you for your help. New preacher coming to town. Little boy riding a bicycle, and the preacher stopped and said, Son, said, where's the post office? 
the little boy said, well, you go down here and turn and go down there and get to the post office. And the preacher said, well, you see that church over there? The little boy said, yes, sir. He said, you come over there Sunday and I'll show you how to find Jesus. He said, no way. You can't even find a way to the post office. <laughs> don't forget. Praise the Lord. That's all right. Hey, we have a little fun in church, right? Hey, Amen. That's what we need to. Yeah, we come to reverence the Lord, but we come to have a little fun. We're not sticks in the wood, right? All right. You know, I just want to say uh, with what Sister Julia was talking about, if you can, be a part of that. And see, sometimes you got to think, what situation? Now, I know people have to learn and come out of it, and there's a certain amount of self-responsibility, I understand. But you don't know how blessed you've been. You've been. Maybe you didn't grow up in a situation where you had to fend for everything you had. And the Bible says this. Now, we don't, there again, I've always preached, we give because it's unto the Lord, and we give to help people. But the Lord if you plant seed in the right place and for the right motives and do that, he will bless you. And I just thought about when Sister Julia was up reading in um, Psalms 41.1, says, Oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor. The Lord rescues them when they are in trouble. You would never go wrong. You can see it all throughout the Bible that God will bless you if you help the needy and the poor. Amen. That's not just Michael Johnson getting up here as a humanitarian heart, and I do have one. But I'm saying, that's the Word. That's the Bible, right? Amen. So, that would be a great mission. Because every little bit counts up, all right? Praise the Lord. Well, how many of you are glad to be here today? Amen. And you are ready to give. You can't outgive God, right? He says he'll supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen? He wishes above all else that you prosper and be in health. God is for you. And when, when you give into tithes and offerings, it's like Brother Oral Roberts said years ago. He was the one, of course it's really the Bible, but he was really the first one to really bring it out about seed time and harvest. And about how giving, when you give and you plant in good soil, that you'll reap a harvest. Now, it doesn't come up overnight in most cases. But if you be patient and you do not get weary, as the Bible says, in well-doing, he will bless you. Now, just don't humor me, but you have applied this in your life. I'm not talking about one or two times. But you have applied it consistently. And you tell me with a show of hands that <clears throat> those that have applied it, have you been blessed? Have you seen God touch you in your life? Amen. Amen. You know, the other day, and I will get on with this, but I was thinking about it. You know, some people probably say in their mind, well, he's rich and he's, this man's rich. I know this person's very wealthy and they don't care. They don't give nothing to the church. They don't care anything about it. Well, you can get a long ways. God still gave them the ability to make money give them great intellect. It was still God who got them where they were. But just think about it. If they can get that far on self-made, but it really ain't self-made, it's God. But if they could do that without giving to God, can you imagine what they could do if they gave to God? Because God's not a, dis he's not a respecter of persons, right? There's some people, their education, with their intellect, they can do very well. And I think it's good that people do well. But I'm saying all of us can do even better. And that's not our main reason. But God doesn't lie. If you give, he'll give it back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. Amen. He'll provide. He's our provision. Amen. Lord, we just thank you as we take our tithes and offerings this morning. As we, this is our first offering here for our tithes and our offering. That you would bless the people that give. Lord, as they give... We just believe that they would receive a harvest in due season. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody says, 
Amen. Just sing it with me, everybody. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your heart. You deserve the glory and the honor. All of you know, or most of you know, if you're a visitor, you may not know this, but what we do, and we've done it for many, 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 many years, and <laughs> you'd think I could talk that fast, didn't you? We've done it for a whole lot of years. We've taken one extra offering on Sunday, the first Sunday of each month. Now, it started as we gave to pray down, pay down, excuse me, pray down too, pay down the principal payment on our mortgages, on our buildings. But thank God because of that and your faithful stewardness over the years and the many that have given, we don't have mortgages on these buildings anymore. Amen. But we still have upkeep of the old facility, you know, cut the grass, keep the place looking good, and ever so often... It won't happen but so often, but we'll have where we'll have to, you know, every 20 years pull up the floor, uh, uh, put a new floor on the gym floor. We'll have to put a new roof on our uh, parsonage back there last year. So these things come up. So what we do is ask people to continue to give in order to upkeep and things that come about in the future. So we just ask that if you would, each person... Give what the Lord lays on your heart. We said a baseline, if you could give $50 a person, $100 a couple, or whatever you could give. If it ain't but $5, if, hey, if you can afford a dollar, one dollar. God will bless you. Now, I want you to think bigger than that, but I'm saying do what you can, what you feel is in your budget, and sometimes even if God will stretch you a little bit because you can't outgive God toward this. Anyway, God bless you all as you give toward this. Amen. You deserve the glory. Everybody sing with me. Lord, we lift. You deserve the glory.
Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing today? I just want to say it's good to have a couple people here. Uh, Brother Kent Montgomery's brother's here today. Now, I know you told me before, sir, but I'm sorry. What was your first name? Monty. Monty. All right. Brother Kent's brother, Monty's here today. So give him a hand. So he's a baseball player too, right? All right. <laughs> all right. And uh, it's, also, it's good to have all of you, but it's particularly good to have Maureen, Cooper, and Jordan here today. <clears throat> and I believe I saw Rory a while ago, right? All right. I praise the Lord. All right. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Oh, and we're just going to celebrate him, right? And congratulations to Tina and Steve back there. They just happily got married. I did their ceremony last week. So <laughs> praise the Lord. Hope you had a great week. First week of marriage. But I see, hey, praise God, you're in church. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Well, last week I talked about uh, a couple of things about just the traveler and how I read a story from Samuel and talked about how that um, the traveler represents thoughts and how that we have to cast down thoughts that are not coming from God. So when I originally did this thing, I, had, I told my mother, and uh, those of you that weren't here last week, I'll tell you, I said, you know, she was over, not last night, but Saturday night before and at my house. And uh, anyway, I, was, I had like 20, normally I write out stuff, I type my sermons out, have my notes. I'll go about no more than 20 pages. I had like 34 pages in this thing. It just kept coming. And I showed it to her and she said, please don't preach that in one service. <laughs> but it worked out anyway as I got through, I went through it some. So I'm going to finish it today. I'm going to try to recap the beginning. So today I will tell you I've got something planned afterwards. This may be a little longer than normal. I try to move it through. But I believe the Lord has led me to preach this and I want to try to finish it today. And if, it, and if it works out that I have to go three weeks, I'll do three weeks on it. But uh, let's just go. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 4. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. All right. Now, it says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except the little e ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. And the traveler came by to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So let's summarize what was going on. David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and to cover it up, he had her husband Uriah killed. And Nathan the prophet confronted David, but he just didn't go in and say, hey, I know you're a murderer and you're an adulterer. He didn't chastise him. But instead, he used a parable to confront him. And this is the one he did. So in verse 5, so well, let me say biblical historians back then will tell you that in Bible days, when travelers came about, there were two different things, two different ways to help them to achieve that. Uh, some of the people would take some food and water and just give it to them and they'd go on their merry way. And some would invite the traveler into their home. So it says, in this case, the rich man took in the traveler and fed him. And what, what was so crazy about the whole thing, 
if he had all these thousands of lambs that he could have used and gave the man of one of his own. But instead he had to take the flock or take the lamb, the one lamb that was like a daughter to the poor man and had him slewed up, slewed, roasted and fed to the traveler. But here's what happened. Pick it up in verse 5. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would also have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So the sword hit David's house four times. This was in major battles concerning his children. And notice that, as I said last week, the parable's main character was a traveler, someone coming from the outside they weren't familiar with, right? So the traveler represents or can represent evil thoughts, wrong thoughts. Thoughts coming in from the outside that are not of God. How many of you know this happens a lot today? We surely cannot help that we live in a fallen world where negative and bad thoughts are constantly being sent our way, where thoughts of failure, inferiority, sin, adultery, fornication, all types of immorality come. But the problem is not when we have these thoughts, but when we dwell on them and they cause a stronghold to form in our life. And that is what the rich man did. He invited the traveler to stay for dinner and he fed him. So don't feed wrong thoughts. You can't let wrong thoughts, thoughts that are not of God, in. You need to starve those thoughts, amen? Listen, the devil is using music, movies, the internet. He's using everything in his arsenal to try to destroy the minds of the people and to poison them, so to speak. You see, Esau was a man, what, what a date, he loved, God loved Jacob. He did, it says in the scripture he hated Esau. No, he didn't hate Esau. What that means is he hated his ways. He didn't like the way he did. He would open up his mind to anything, Esau. And God doesn't like it because he wants us to not get in trouble. He wants us to not get into things that are bad. He doesn't want our thinking to go wrong because that's where it all starts. God hates it when people, not the people, but he hates the idea or the act of people when they just let any old thing into their spirit. Through what we see, through what we hear, all kinds of ways. See in Revelation, in the last days, the Antichrist will put his mark on the forehead of his followers, 666. Could it be that he is targeting the forehead because it is symbolic of Satan wanting to target the minds of people in the last days? Right? There's a spirit that's very predominant in our society today. If you would, turn to Genesis 6. Genesis 6, verse 5. And I went over this, but I'll briefly run as fast as I can till I pick it back up from last week. <clears throat> the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. Now remember, what had happened was people would live a long time. Methuselah lived 969 years, but people's life expectancy kept coming down because of sin. And then when these... Fallen angels came down and the men began to have relations with them and these 
weird giants were beginning to form. It was so messed up, God said, no, I'm not going to live. I don't, lifespan, the most anybody can live will be 120 years. And that was right before this. But in verse 5, pick it up, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Now, don't you see that in a lot of the world today? Everything they think is consistently and totally evil. I can't even watch tennis anymore without seeing something. There's this company called Verbo, V-R-B-O. I don't know what Verbo does, but they sure are trying to promote an agenda. They've had three different Three different uh, advertisements in the last year as I'm watching some good tennis on the tennis channel and right in the middle before I saw it, they've shown, they show two men walking out getting married and two different couples, two women kissing on three, last three commercials. I'm doing, well, do you have any commercials showing heterosexuals kissing? I don't mean to be ugly, but they're promoting an agenda. I love the people. I don't hate people because of sin. We all have had come sh fallen short and had sin in our life. But do we have to every week see it on a... No, the world is thinking as dominant as they can now as a whole. And I'm not up here as some self-righteous know-it-all like I'm just perfect. I'm not coming across that way. But what I am saying is right, people of the Lord now need to stand up for righteousness. Because there's a spirit that's trying to pervade through this country. Thinking evil all the time. Having thoughts of adultery, fornication, homosexuality, transgenderism. And they're taking the visitor of lust and morality inside their heart. But it leads to death. Because the Bible says that the wages... I'm trying to help people. I'm not mad at them. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. I went up to Virginia the other night to a camp meeting and a gentleman that usually preaches, he preaches on faith, prosperity, healing, the goodness of God. And thank God for all that. He said, but the Lord has sent me tonight to, to cause some good trouble. He said, what I mean by that? And he talked about it. He talked about how that COVID-19 was sin of the devil to inflict pain and death and sickness, but also in order to drive people out of the church. And he said the enemy has been very successful. And that's not a doubt in belief, a doubt and unbelief. That's where we are. But I declare to you today, we have got to stand up more than ever and say, let's get back to the things of God. Let's come to the house of God. Let's get back to our roots. Amen. Our roots. Our roots are loving Jesus, treating one another with kindness, walking in love, forsaking things that are evil. Amen? With the advancement of technology, Satan has issued orders against the new generation in particular. And he was talking the other night and he said, you know, he's talking about, I had never heard of this until uh, a minister I heard on TV the other night. Then I heard a gentleman Thursday night talking about it. He's talking about, that, and he prayed particularly over our younger generation. And he said, they think there's, a thing, there's a thing called my truth. I said, my truth? What is my truth? Well, my truth is whatever I want to believe. I don't even have to confess my sins. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's all right. We can just do anything we want to. By, well, I, after all, grace has covered us, right? But he began to talk about how, yes, the message of grace is good. We need to love people. We're not under the law. We're not under, it's not your good works that moves God. God grants us healing and grants us peace and grants us love and grants us prosperity because we didn't deserve it, but he loves us. But what he was saying was, now we've taken grace and we've almost gone into licentiousness. Like, you could do anything. What did Paul say? He said, God forbid, right? It does not get, when we understand the grace and love of God, it makes us not want to. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. We were looking the other night at a, it was a meeting and Jesse Duplantis was preaching. It was Cameron and me, myself, were over at my mom's house. And we were about to leave the house 
And he got into the altar call. And I said, Cameron, you want to go? He said, it's whatever up to you. I know he's trying to be polite, but he really wanted to stay. I said, we can stay and watch it. And he said, ever since that day, he's been different. He said, all my, the people that were being prayed for, I mean, everywhere. Isn't that great? People were being touched and healed. And, and he said, I just felt a peace since then. God wants to do something in our younger generation. He wants to do something in us today. And he's the only true peace we can have. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. See, the 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 says, uh, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, they're not fleshly. But mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. We just got to tell that visitor that evil thought that you are not good enough, that evil thought that you're not worthy enough, that evil thought that tries to come against you to bring a stronghold in your life. We've got to cast every thought down that does not, that, excuse me, that does exalt itself against the knowledge and the Spirit of God. Amen. Would you go with me to Revelation chapter 7, verse 3? <clears throat> and Revelation is easy to find because it's the last book. It's the very last one. Revelation 7, 3. Now I'm reading from the NLT here. And it's, but it's okay, whatever, whatever they got. I, you, I don't, that's my fault, I should tell them. <laughs> we do new, I, do, I like to read a lot from the New King James and NLT. But all translations are of the Lord. I'm not one of these guys that said, you got to read from the King James Version. I mean, I think it's good, but whatever ministers to you. But anyway, it says, verse 3, Wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. And I have heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. So, <laughs> you know, the enemy is going to place the mark of the beast, those who take it, and he's going to put it on their forehead, right? And I believe that's symbolic of the mind. Well, just as the enemy always has a counterfeit, look what Jesus, he said, God is going to place the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. Those that get saved, 144,000 for sure, will not bow their knee to the Antichrist, and God's name will be put on their forehead. Amen. Praise the Lord. Exodus 28, 37 and 38 says, Attach the medallion with a blue cord to the front of Aaron's turban where it must remain. Aaron must wear it on his forehead so he may take on himself any guilt of the people of Israel when they consecrate their sacred offerings. He must always wear it on his forehead so the Lord will accept the people. See, I don't be I believe, yes, that was real, but it's all of these things in the Bible, but it's symbolic. You see, God wants us to have a pure mind. He wants us to have the mind of Christ. And the way we do that is by reading his word, by praying, fellowshipping with one another, and not allowing things that are detrimental to our mind and to our spirit to allow them in. In this hour, we particularly every day need to get up and put on our turban of holiness. You can't be neutral and just sit back and be casual. You've got to really, we are in a spiritual warfare. And I've never been one to preach on this much, but we are in a spiritual war. We, with all that's trying to come against us, we have to fight for our families today. 
And I don't mean a physical fight, but I mean in the spirit, through prayer. We have to fight for our nation. We have to fight for our church. Why am I preaching on this stuff? I, for many years, have preached on the goodness of God, and I believe in it, the faith of God and how it'll change your life and the good things he wants to do for you and how he wants you to be healed and prosper. And that's all true. It's still true. But we come to a day we can't lay with our head in the sand. Right? As I said last week, and I'll say it, just to keep you abreast of what's going on, I am not in no way, and I'm not going to make an issue of it, and I'm not trying to make it political, but I want you to see things the way the world is setting things up. I, if you are for the vaccine and you wanted to take it and you have taken it, great. That's fine. It's a personal choice. But I do want you to know that I believe personally that, you know, the make, in other words, when they're requiring people to, you can't go to a ball game or you can't go on this flight or you can't do that. Yes, I know it's in the name of safety and I'm all for that. But a lot of that is leading, it's a forerunner of what is going to happen. Because when people that are left behind will have a choice, they'll either have to take that mark on their forehead to buy or sell anything. And if they don't take it, praise God, I hope they don't take it. But if they take it, they're doomed to hell forever. Right? And you say, well, pastor... How could, how could that be fair? How could a loving God? No, he's given us them plenty of opportunities by that point. His word will have been preached around the world because he said he's not coming. People have, he had been spoken to them, but if you're closed off and you're not sensitive to anything and you don't hear anything, then God can't do, he has to speak to you, but sometimes we don't listen, do we? Even as Christians, praise the Lord. Philippians 4, 8, and 9 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And it says in Romans 12, 2, says, And do not be conformed to this world. What does the world mean? The way the world thinks. What does the world think today? I'm out for me I'm out for whatever feels good. I'm, I'm out for whatever I think is good for me. I don't care if it's, I don't care if it's wrong or right. What it is, it's rel- wrong or right. It's just relative anyway. I just go do what I want to do. Well, that's not being, we don't need to be conformed to the world. But we are transformed, which means changed by the renewing of our mind that we prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. See, we have to, and I'm not perfect at this, but I'm trying to get better. We have to renew our mind every day. You say, well, I gave my heart to the Lord a long time ago. Well, that's good. But in order to keep your mind and your heart right, we have to still renew our mind every day. If we don't renew our mind, we'll lose the fire. How many of you have seen people lose the fire? You'll lose you'll lose what the presence of God is like and you'll get filled up with all this carnal thinking. I like what Romans 12, 2 in NLT says. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will which will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Amen? Amen. See, God is not trying to take fun from you because the wages of sin are what? Death. He's trying to keep you out of trouble. He's trying to keep you from things. He wants you to lead a long and productive and healthy life. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Psalms 23, 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cups runneth over. Now, 
according to biblical historians, anointing the head with oil was shepherd's terminology. David knew that the shepherd's head had to be anointed with oil. Why is this? Because flies would land on the head of the unanointed sheep and plant eggs in their nose. I don't want to gross you out here, but it's true. Which would turn into worms. The worms would get into the sheep's brain. See where it's going? Into their brain, causing them to go mad or insane. The sheep would bang their head on trees, rocks, posts, or brush, trying to get rid of that irritation. Look. All of the mental illness going on in our nation and this whole world could be fixed if people would give their hearts to Christ and center their mind on what God says about them. He could remove all that guilt. He would remove all the shame. Because what? If you're in Jesus, there's now no what? No condemnation to those in Christ. He would remove it all if you just fix your eyes on him, if you would just think all things that are praiseworthy, that are lovely, of a good report, then you can transform the way you think and your mind. Oh, hallelujah. Listen, God wants to transform us, amen? And it all starts in the mind. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Oh, hallelujah. We must cleanse our thoughts with the word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. You see, when the sheep's head was anointed with oil, the oil would repel or put off the flies. And the flies did not want to be where the oil was. So I'm telling you, the oil of the word of God you put thoughts in your mind that says, I am capable. When you think on, I am worthy. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I can, I, all my needs are supplied because, he, because of his riches in glory. And if I'm a giver, God will give it back to me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Why? Because I'm centering my thoughts on the goodness of God. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Psalms 133, 1 and 2 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's what we're doing today. We're dwelling together in unity, coming to praise God and glorify Him. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Get your thought life anointed. Get your mind anointed because the rest of your body will follow suit according to this. The Holy Spirit, people, has the power to repel depression, to repel fear, to repel torment. You know, David killed Goliath with five stones, right, in a slingshot. Where did he hit David? I mean, excuse me, Goliath. Where did David hit Goliath? He hit him in the head. What was the first thing after he did when he killed him? He cut his head off. See, I don't believe all this, that was real, but I believe all the stuff is symbolic of we got to get our head right. We got to get the mind of Christ. Amen. Listen, if you want victory in life, you must win the battle between the ears, the battle of the mind. I'm so glad that we have the Bible today to renew our mind. You don't have to be depressed and defeated. You're born to win. You were born to overcome. So fill your mind with what God says about you today. Amen. Daily, the high priest back in the Old Testament was given instructions to do seven things. I want to focus on one of them. God said there always had to be an altar in order to maintain or keep the fire. And the high priest had to sweep out the ashes from the burnt offering every morning. 
This is an Old Testament symbolism of renewing the mind. Ashes would accumulate and choke the fire out if not swept out. Ashes would accumulate and eventually overtake the fire if the ashes were not swept out. If you would, turn to me to Leviticus chapter 6 verse 10. Okay, in the morning, I'm reading from the NLT. In the morning, after the priest on duty has put on his official linen clothing and linen undergarments, he must clean out the ashes of the burnt offering and put them beside the altar. Then he must take off these garments, change back into his regular clothes, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonially clean. Meanwhile, the fire on the altar must keep be kept burning. It must never go out. That's symbolic of our fire. It must never go out. Each morning the priest will add fresh wood to the fire and arrange the burnt offering on it. He will then burn the fat of the peace offerings on it. But whatever is left over may be eaten on the second day. So, what it's saying here is that ashes are yesterday's thoughts. Ashes are yesterday's memories that maybe weren't so good. And if you don't sweep them out, you can't keep the fire of God inside you to burn out all the bad. Any person who does not sweep out those ashes grows colder, grows colder and colder, and lose, completely loses their fire. Just like if we had a fireplace. You have to clean out your fireplace once in a while if you use it at your house, right? Because eventually the fire will not work anymore. It'll go out. We have got to take, clean out all the stuff that the devil, or we used to believe before we got born again. See, even though your spirit gets saved, the devil, because he's the author of this world, he still, he has no power anymore what Jesus did on the cross. But one thing he has access to is your mind. The only way he can defeat you is he tells you, he uses thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. He says, you are so unworthy. Why, you are such a horrible sinner. There's no way God can love you. Look at where you came from. You can't be successful. Why, your family didn't have any education, Harley. You're, you just came from a bad environment. You can't make it. That's yesterday's ashes. But what does God say? He says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you me. He says that you are above and not beneath. You are the head and not the tail. He says you are victor in life. Amen. So we got to take those thoughts out and put what God says about us. You have to renew your mind. How do you do that? By putting on some worship. Put on some worship music. It's simple and inexpensive. You can be taking a shower and have it play. Just don't get it to the water now. I mean, just, we want to be smart. But you can, you can brush your teeth. You can sing in the shower. And I didn't say you had to sing well because the Bible doesn't require you to sing well in the shower. He just says, we all make a, everything that hath breath. Praise the Lord. He said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And as long as it's between you and God, it'll be joyful. Just, you know, you know. <laughs> just have a little fun here. But see, really, we have to set the atmosphere for the day. What are we doing? If you live out in this world, you're going to pick up some stuff from the world. People, I don't mean anything by this, but they use profanity now. Some words, like we used to say, uh, just can I, have a, can I have some tomatoes on my sandwich? Uh, pass the bread, please. 
It's like every other word is the F word, using God's name in vain, and they think nothing of it. Well, I don't mean to be ugly to them, but if they can do all that and they're not ashamed of who their God is, how much more should we raise our hand and not be ashamed of who our God is and worship Him and praise Him for His goodness? Hallelujah. I don't mean to be ugly, but don't be intimidated. Right? We can't let that stuff choke the fire of God out of us. And we don't need to just get excited when we're here to praise and worship on Sunday morning. Put it in your car as you're in your house. When you're going to work, oh, let the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. It was speaking of other tongues. Oh, that edifies you. Oh, it speaks mysteries unto God. Amen. Put on your praise blaze and let it burn out depression. Let it burn out despondency. You're renewing your mind. Amen. Turn to 2 Samuel 11. I'll be finished pretty soon here, but I want to finish this up today. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It said, It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. He didn't go out to fight. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her for she was cleansed from, the impure, from her impurity and she returned to her house. See, David, if he would have, this is a good lesson and to do what God called you to do and you won't get in trouble. Amen. David should have been out there leading the army, but he sent somebody else. When the kings went to war, David stayed home. His attitude was, let someone else do it. Let someone else fight. Our attitude sometimes is, let someone else praise the Lord. Why, I get excited, you know, that's okay. But let them do it. I'm too tired to do it today. Let somebody else do this in the church or let somebody else. No, you do it. You take whatever he's called you to do, you step up. David, if he simply would have been doing what he was supposed to do, leading his army into battle instead of sending somebody else, he wouldn't have gotten in all that trouble. Look, the day that we live in is... Kings go to war. We're in a spiritual warfare. Revelation 1, 5, and 6, and says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. We are kings and priests with God. And with all the negative and sinful and demonic stuff coming at us from work and the atmosphere and the world and just in general, and with trials and problems coming at you, you, you can't just stand there. You're going to have to attack the devil every day. But it doesn't have to be done with a stressful attitude. It can be done in peace and with the joy of the Lord. Just simply meditate on his word and what he says about you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. After all, Ephesians 2, 2 says, You follow the sinful ways of the world and obey the leader of the power of darkness. He is the devil who is now working in the people who do not obey God. Satan is the prince of darkness. And he is saying, 
if I can get you on my home field, then I can take you out. So being at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people will mess you up every time. Who are we hanging out with these days? Temptation's going to try to come even in the midst of good people you're around. How much more will it when someone is walking and doing things they shouldn't, right? See, David lost the control of his thought life, though. First of all, he wasn't doing what he should have been doing. He should have been out to battle. But then he lost control. He didn't just take a glance. It'd been different. See, it's like I said last week. We're all human. You, if you see someone of the opposite sex walking down the street, you might think they're pretty. And it's okay to say, wow, they're pretty. Or they're handsome. But leave it at that. Amen. Don't continue to dwell and dwell and dwell unless it's your spouse. Because <laughs> the devil will lead you into trouble. What's he doing? He's trying to create a stronghold. But you cast down that thought and said, no, I'm faithful to my wife. I'm faithful to my husband. I have no desire to be with anyone. And if you're not married, then you say, Lord, I'm going to be faithful to you until you bring me the right one. And then I can be with someone. I wasn't always perfect at everything in my life, but the Bible said that if you train up a child in the way he goes, he shall not depart. And when I got to ECU, I, like I said, I did some things. I partied a little bit. I got away from God a little bit. But I'll never forget one night, I've told you this before, I'm going to join a fraternity, and the Lord spoke to me. He says, if you do that, your destruction is coming your way. I got so scared. That was the voice of God. It was because my dad and my mom, particularly my dad, he, root, he prayed for me and he always taught me the right thing. Praise the Lord. Praise God. To, off the subject, but by the way, today, six months that my dad passed away and I do miss him. But I know just like Brother George and others that have passed away in the Lord. I believe sooner than later, we're going to reunite. Amen. Amen. That's our hope. That's our assurance. Praise the Lord. Let me end it right here. The high priest in the Old Testament had three gates to open every morning. The outer gate, the inner gate, and the Holy of Holies. And there's three gates that you need to control what you open and what you open them up to. The first gate is the eye gate. What you see with your eyes. Matthew 6, 22 and 23 from the New King James Version says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? See, David had to learn to let no unclean thing come before his eyes once he rededicated his life to God. So what are you looking at today? I'm not against movies. I think there's a lot of good movies out there. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of bad stuff too. And you don't need to put all that garbage in front of you in your spirit. Amen? The second gate is the ear gate. What you hear. That's why it's important to speak life over your friends. If your parents speak life over your children, speak life over your church, and speak life over yourself. Because your ears hear your voice. And you can have what you say, amen? amen? Also, what are you listening to? Are you listening to music that is good? Personally, see, I was a music major. And I like classical music. I like opera. I performed in some operas. 
like I told you last week, most people are probably happy with this, but on XM Radio, they took off the Met Opera Radio and put Elvis on there. But those of you that like Elvis, I'm sure y'all like that, and that's fine. I still got some CDs. <laughs> but I like all kinds of music. I'm not necessarily saying we have to sit around every 100% of the time and listen to something about Jesus, okay? But I would say the majority of time, do that. Look, I like music, different music, just for entertainment sometimes. As long as it's not corrupt and it's bringing me down. But some music today is musical pornography is what I call it. It talks about unfilthiness, sexual perversion. It, and listen, a lot of this women, I mean, excuse me, a lot of this music more than, more than not puts down and degrades women. Hey, they're precious. Women and men are precious. In the sight of God, we as human beings are, and we shouldn't listen to anything that degrades people and makes them a second-rate citizen. Amen? Even the world would agree with that. I think it's okay if you want to listen to a love song. I sang a love song to my wife a couple of years ago. You're more than a million, chance of a lifetime. You know, or sing like, don't worry, be happy, Bobby McFair. You remember that? I mean, look, I'm all for having some fun. I don't have, I'm not a stick in the mud that bears my head and just says, you know, I sing praise and worship songs and that's all I do. But at the same time, I do let that primarily be my music because I want to grow in Christ. I've got a devil to contend with out there that wants to take my family, wants to take my church, wants to take our nation. And I need to be strong in the Lord. How about you today? Hallelujah. Another th th gate is your mouth. Watch what comes out of your mouth. We can have what we say. That's not, did you know you can have what you say was not, it's not, it's not some theory that Kenneth Hagin came up with even though he talked about it a lot. It's what the Bible says. Mark eleven twenty three and 4. I, having the God kind of faith, you can have what you say. If you speak peace, if you speak joy, if you speak victory, you can have it. But if you speak doubt and depressed and woe is me and blah, 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 you can have that too. So watch what you hear Watch what you see and watch what comes out of your mouth. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good, isn't he? Amen. Everybody stand. And I want you to say this with me. Say, Lord, I choose to be at the right place, which leads me to the right people, which leads me to the right timing in the Lord. I choose not to be at the wrong place, which leads me to be with the wrong people at the wrong time. I choose to put the Word of God in my mind. I choose to put what God says about me in my thoughts. He says, I'm a victor. He says, I'm a winner. He says, I'm more than a conqueror. He says, I'm worthy. And I am capable of doing everything that he's called me to do. And I cast out what the devil says about me. He says, I'm weak. I cast that aside. He says, I'm not capable. I cast those away. He says that I'm not worthy. I cast that away. And I tell him that he's not worthy, that he will one day be thrown in the lake of fire and that he's nothing but the defeated foe. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you believe it with me today?
Now look, I felt led to do this last week, but it didn't happen. And I'm not going to force anybody to come up here, and I'm not going to pray for you long. But I felt like to do this. We, you know I was talking about today, about the oil, and about how, and this is an act of symbolism, but yet it's, I believe the Lord is uh, leading me to do this. You know how I talked about they anointed them with oil. He anointed the sheep, the, the anointed sheep, what? They were all right. They got, they got along fine. But the unanointed sheep had the worms to come in their nose, get in their brain, and it drove them crazy. Well, I believe that's symbolic, symbolic, excuse me, of the anointing oil of God. I have some oil here today. And I want, as a minister of the gospel, I'm not going, I'm going to move this thing fast. It won't take long if I have some ushers to help me. But if you want me to anoint you with oil, I'm not going, and there's nothing wrong if you don't come down, but I encourage you to. If you want me to anoint you with oil today, I'll do it fast. Then I'll anoint you with that anointing oil that your minds will be filled with the Holy Spirit. That your minds will keep at peace. Now you, of course, you will do it 